Welcome everyone. I hope all of you are doing great. My name is Luma Almana. I'm a petroleum engineer currently working as a field engineer with Halliburton Iraq and I will be your moderator for today's session. On behalf of Arab Oil and Gas Academy, I would like to welcome you all to the first session of Natural Gas Engineering Internship. Today's webinar is about gas dehydration given by a remarkable guest speaker, Dr. Abdelaziz Khulaifat. Our guest speaker is a petroleum engineer with more than 23 years of experience. He had both his PhD and master's degree in chemical engineering from Illinois Institute of Technology, USA. Currently, he's a professor of petroleum engineering at the American University in Cairo. Prior to that, he was a professor of energy engineering at the American University of Iraq. Previously, he had taken many roles at different academic institutions such as an instructor, assistant professor, associate professor, and a professor, and had held some admin positions, such as founding head of petroleum engineering at Abu Dhabi, chairman of chemical engineering, and many others. Industry-wise, he held the position of a senior reservoir engineer and a, man and a manager for Weatherford Research Center, located at Saudi Arabia. He also was the founder and co-founder of different academic departments and research centers, and authored and co-authored 91 publications on various topics, including journal articles and book chapters in the areas of flow through porous media, hydrocarbon reservoir engineering, unconventional tight and shale gas, and others. He is an active SPE member and awarded several technical and academic awards and was listed among notable alumni at 2017. Please help me to welcome Dr. Khalifat. Dr. Khalifat, it's a pleasure having you here with us. Uh, please don't forget, small reminder for you all, to leave your question in the Q&A uh, section box down below. Dr. Khalifat, the mic is yours. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Luma, for this uh, nice introduction. And thanks to Dr. Ahmed Al-Garhi for the invite and having me on board today. And you guys, uh, good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So our today's topic is gas uh, dehydration, as you can see in this slide. And uh, by the end of today's topic, guys, two outcomes uh, will be met as shown. So the first one, you will be able to predict the temperature and pressure limit for hydrate formation. And the second outcome to achieve is uh, you should be able to explain the methods used to inhibit hydrate formation. The two other outcomes shaded uh, down there will be covered in the next uh, webinar. In order to meet, to meet today's outcomes, uh, uh, first three topics will be covered today. So uh, we will start by an introduction to gas hydrates. Then we will look at uh, 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 the ways how hydrate formation will be predicted. And we will wrap up today's session by the methods used to inhibit hydrate formation. And we will see a few examples as we go on. So in general, guys, when we say dehydration, uh, so uh, it means that we have to get rid of water. So hydrated, it means the system is flooded with water. Dehydration, it means we have to remove water. Now, when it comes to uh, natural gas, basically the process of removing water, vapor, or condensed water from the natural gas is nothing but a dehydration process where we go down to the dew point uh, of water in the gas stream. And the dew point, if you go a little back to uh, thermodynamics, is nothing but the temperature at which water vapor condenses from the gas stream. So it is eventually a, a sale requirements and specified in a sale gas product uh, to meet either, not either, actually both, to meet the dew point and maximum amount of water in the gas to be sold. 
if this or these two criteria will not be met, then operating companies will face some issues in selling their gas. Well, and there are some other reasons actually behind gas dehydration. Uh, the first one is to prevent hydrate formation, and we will see what do we mean by hydrate and what kind of problems are eventually driven by hydrates. And the second one, to avoid corrosion. And when corrosion does occur, I believe most of you guys know that corrosion occurs with the presence of some acid gases, such as hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide. And the third reason actually to uh, dehydrate is uh, a downstream processing requirement. As I said, uh, amount of water or maximum amount of water in the sale gas have to be met, which is usually between four and seven pound per million standard cubic feet of gas. Well, what gas hydrate is? Uh, actually, gas hydrate is a, a solid matter uh, formed because of the existing existence of water in the gas stream, along with some small fraction of hydrocarbon. So the fraction of hydrocarbon in the solid gas hydrate usually is about 10%, while the rest 90% accounts for water. They grow up, guys, as crystals. And you know this, when water freezes, basically it gets crystallized. Exactly the same phenomenon occurs inside the pipelines. And of course, they build up and they create, as you can see in the picture, in the right-hand side, they create basically a plug, which is uh, uh, filling out the pipeline. And if this process continues, guys, this will kill the uh, transport of gas and it will retard the flow of gaseous hydrocarbons in the pipeline. So basically, uh, gas hydrate formation creates lots of problem for those who care about gas transports. Well, uh, this takes us actually to the reasons why gas hydrates get Form. Eventually, I always use a similarity because we know that when we talk about unconventional gas, there is one type of gas which is called gas hydrate. And this gas gets formed at the seabed, similar, for example, to uh, uh, other unconventional uh, gases such as uh, tight gas and chill gas. This one is actually gets, getting formed at the seabed. And what are the conditions at the seabed? We have very high pressure of the hydrostatic column, let's say in the ocean, and the temperature is quite low over there. And the third condition is the presence of water. So basically, these are the three conditions required for any gas hydrates to get formed. There are different types, guys, of hydrates, but in here we will talk about gas hydrates that exist in the uh, gas uh, pipelines or let's say gas treatment facilities and surface facilities, etc. So you should keep in mind these three reasons uh, that should coexist together in order for gas hydrates to get formed. Well, uh, Another question that some of you guys might ask, well, uh, where can we get the water from? Sometimes we talk about dry gas production, but where the water comes from. Eventually, guys, water is always produced with gas in different amounts. So water can come directly from the gas reservoir to the surface, then to flow lines and uh, treatment facilities. Another uh, uh, way of looking at that, if you uh, had taken any unconventional course, let's say shale gas, you know that in order to produce uh, gas from shale gas reservoir, we have to frack it. And each frack job requires up to 6 million gallons of water. 
not all this water comes back. Only 35% of this water comes back and can be cleaned up. But the rest eventually stays in the reservoir and it keeps coming back along with the produced gas. Another actually source of water uh, uh, comes from the surface facilities when we uh, separate uh, uh, gas and water from oil. Uh, as you know, uh, oil always uh, comes with some uh, associated gas and they come at different pressures and in here pass through different stages of separation with a high pressure or lower pressure or through the free water knockout. From the top of each of those vessels, eventually gas is separated and taken out to a gas treatment facilities where the gas first is sweetened, then we remove the water out of the gas. Uh, water eventually goes out from the top of each of those vessels and passes through the mist extraction and it has to be removed because of the reasons I outlined earlier. So these are basically the main sources where we can get uh, water along with gas. Or why should we worry about it if there is, let's say, minimal amount of water? Well, uh, this takes us to the next step. How can we predict actually whether hydrate will be formed or not? And what are the methods that can be followed to do so? There are two main methods uh, utilized uh, uh, widely in the industry to uh, uh, cover this part. The first methods are nothing but an approximate method, while the second one are analytical methods. So uh, approximate, not in terms of numerical analysis, but in terms of uh, uh, experimentation and having some charts and utilizing those charts to uh, uh, find or to predict hydrate formations. Well, uh, then these two methods are used for three purposes or for one or two or three of them, okay, at the same time. Uh, as you know, guys, or as I just explained, there are three reasons or the three uh, things or three cases that have to coexist in order for hydrate to get formed. Now we need to define each of those. What does promote hydrate formation? We need to uh, quantify them in terms of number. So the above methods, guys, can be used too. Uh, determine hydrate formation temperature for a given pressure or the opposite. We can find hydrate formation pressure for a given temperature. So one variable is given and we can find the other one. And the third reason we said we have to have free water. Then these methods should help us to determine the amount of water vapor that condenses out of, uh, let's say, the gas stream when we reach the dew point. So these are the three things that can be determined by the above uh, method. And you know, guys, uh, gas comes from the reservoir with high temperature. It reaches the surface with a little bit of drop in temperature. But as it is transported away from the wellhead, eventually we have lots of losses in temperature due to cooling, especially if the gas pipeline is laid on the surface, not below the freezing point or buried down there. So guys, the first method, which is an approximate method, uh, uh, these methods eventually, they are based on chart. As you can see in the right hand side of this slide, we have a chart uh, of uh, pressure for hydrate formation in PSIA versus temperature. And of course, now what we said, we need to know one uh, parameter or one variable or one condition. We need to know either pressure or temperature. And with the help of gas specific gravity, and one given property, we can determine the third one. 
So guys, in order to use this chart, so the first thing to do is to determine gas specific gravity. Uh, and you should keep in mind that we talk about gas flowing in pipelines at high pressure. So this gas is not an ideal gas anymore. You, you got to know from thermodynamics that gas can be considered ideal where the compressibility factor is actually one when the pressure is close to atmospheric pressure. So you have to treat this gas as a real gas when you calculate the specific gravity of the gas. And the other thing that you have to keep in mind, uh, this gas consists of many components. So you have to calculate a specific gravity for a gas mixture, it's not for a single component. The procedure is quite easy and I believe you have covered this in uh, uh, many courses like uh, reservoir fluid properties and in thermodynamics, flash calculations, etc. So basically uh, knowing the molecular weight for each component, you can, uh, and uh, it's small fraction, you can calculate the molecular weight of the gas, then you divide it by the molecular weight of the uh, uh, air, you find the specific gravity of your gas, and uh, next you use figure one for any given condition to find the third uh, conditions, whether, which is either pressure or temperature. Let's see how can we do this with a simple example. Uh, in this example, example one, if the specific gravity of a natural gas stream is calculated and found to be 0.69, uh, you are asked to find the hydrate formation pressure in PSIA at a temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So what you do, you go down to uh, X axis at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and you go up until intersection with 0.69 uh, specific gravity or gas gravity, and then you go to the left side and eventually you can find the uh, pressure to be 300 theory. The opposite can be done as well. So uh, this is so the first use of approximate methods, guys. Uh, the second use of approximate method is to find the amount of water. You remember we said three things have to be determined, pressure, temperature, and amount of water that condenses out of the stream. So amount of water, guys, again, can be determined based on uh, a maketa wihi chart, shown actually in the right-hand side, which shows the amount of water content of sweet natural gas in bound per million standard cubic feet, okay, at this condition versus water dew point and determine pressure from the previous step. So this, this basically uh, uh, tells us that if we know the temperature and if we know the pressure of gas uh, 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 hydrate formation, then using this figure, we can know exactly how much water can be produced or it can drop out actually out of this stream. Let's see how can we utilize this chart in terms of uh, example. Okay. Natural gas, example statement, natural gas saturated with water vapor at condition of 1000 PSIA and 90 degrees Fahrenheit is exposed to cooling in a flow line due to heat losses. So this is a problem. Whenever you hear that the, the uh, flow line is exposed to heat cooling, then the temperature might drop and go below the dew point where uh, hydrates get formed. So uh, due to heat losses, where the temperature reaches 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have a drop in temperature from 90 to 35, which is almost 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pressure 
remains the same. There is no pressure drop. The first part of the example, guys, you are asked to calculate how much liquid water will drop out of the gas. This is uh, quite easy, okay? So, but we have to be careful. We can use actually the figure, uh, figure one with two cases, 90 degrees and uh, 35 degrees. And the difference between them will find the amount of water. And the second part, uh, uh, assuming that the gas flowing through the pipeline is to reach a delivery point at 300 PSIA pressure. So now, in addition to cooling, we have pressure drop, okay? Although uh, uh, eventually for uh, dehydrate or for hydrate formation, we need to have high pressure, okay? Uh, and you are asked to find the corresponding dew point of the gas. So we need to look what is the dew point at a pressure of 300 PSI A instead of 1000. Let's see how can we do that. So the first thing guys, we know that we uh, have a temperature of 90 degrees. We go up to a pressure of 1000, okay, PSI A. At the intersection point, we go to the left and we find out the content or water content of the gas is 46 pound, okay? This is pound per million standard cubic feet, okay? So this is the first thing guys to uh, determine. The second thing we uh, know that because of cooling, eventually what happens, the temperature drops down to uh, 35 degrees, okay? And again, we go to the same intersection line, which is 1000, okay? We uh, move to the left and we find out the water contents of the gas is almost 7.6 pound per million standard cubic feet, okay? And the difference guys between these two values is the amount of water that will drop out. So 46 minus 7.6 is equal to 38.4 pound per million standard cubic feet. There is an S missed actually here. So this is the first part, guys. It's, it's, it's quite easy and straightforward. All what you need to find the temperature drop or to find the amount of water at two temperature. Now the second part we need to uh, uh, eventually assuming that the gas flowing through the same system, but we have a, a pressure drop of 300 or up to until 300 PSI. So a pressure drop of 700 PSI A. So guys, we go to the first case. When we had the water content of 7.6 initially, and we move right to intersect with the line of what? with the line of a pressure of 300 PSIA, and then we go all the way down and we find the dew point temperature of almost 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So see the benefit, it's, it's an approximate method. It's straightforward, it's easy, can even be used by, by babies. And of course, it's, it's very fast but uh, you can get an estimate and a quick estimate. And that's why they are called approximate method. They are not exact and based on experimentations, okay? Uh, on the other hand, guys, analytical methods exist. And if you remember uh, math, in, in math and in calculus, you always say uh, analytical solution, which is exact solution, okay? So where the range of error is minimized, while approximate, when it comes to math, you use numerical analysis to find approximate solution of any problem. So basically by approximation, you move toward exact solution or analytical uh, solution. So again, guys in here, uh, for a given pressure, we can get or we can estimate the uh, uh, temperature, okay, for uh, gas uh, hydrate formation. 
And of course, guys, here, the temperature and pressure of a gas stream at the wellhead is so important to determine because we need to know where gas hydrates uh, get formed. Are they going to be formed in the vicinity of the wellhead? Are they going to be formed, let's say, 100 kilometers away from the wellhead? So this, this knowledge will add lots of values actually for, uh, for us as petroleum engineer. And of course, the temperature at the wellhead can change as a function of time because you know what's going on in the reservoir as a function of time, because of depletion, because of uh, production tubing, and so on and so forth. So, and because of throttling processes, okay, uh, you can cool a gas by throttling valves, right? So uh, the temperature is not constant uh, for the uh, life of the well. It is changing as a function of time. Let's say a gas well that is initially not producing hydrates, maybe after uh, 15 years will start uh, producing hydrates. Another thing, guys, to keep in mind, the pipelines constructed in the surface, they are constructed to last for at least 40 to 50 years. Uh, if hydrates will start forming right from production or from the first years of production, then they might, and especially with the existence of uh, or presence of acid, acidic gases, then we, we face problem. We face problem related to the capital cost where we have to have work over, maintenance, et cetera, replacement, that costs lots of money. So uh, that's why we need to know this uh, as a function of time and we have to uh, uh, monitor this closely uh, uh, with time. Now, analytical method, how does it work? We go back to this method. So it works guys exactly in the same way you do flash calculations, okay? Uh, or in the same way you do dew point calculations for multi-component mixtures of, of course, hydrocarbons. So the main equation to use in here is shown in equation one, which is the summation of yi, where, where yi is the mole fraction of i component in the vapor phase or in the gaseous phase, divides by Ki, where Ki is the vapor solid, because in here we talk about gas with hydrates, okay? So it's not vapor liquid, it's vapor solid equal equilibrium constant for I component. So each component has its own uh, vapor solid equal equilibrium constant. And this can be determined based on temperature and pressure and usually either tabulated or given by chart. Uh, and this guy's summation over all component. Let's say we have 10 component of gases. Okay, we add for the 10 component, six, six, five, five, whatever number of component. And it should, this summation should add to one. And the right hand side, we have to have uh, one. And of course, X in here is used to uh, calculate Ki. So Ki is nothing but Yi divided by Xi, where Xi is the mole fraction of I component in the solid phase. How do we move ahead? The concept or, uh, of analytical method is quite easy, is not really complicated. Uh, in here, we have a given pressure, but we don't know the temperature. And this is the thing that we have to assume. If you, those of you have, who have taken numerical analysis, you remember in order, let's say, if to solve uh, nonlinear equations, uh, you, you start with an initial guess. If it satisfies your equations, okay, then okay. Otherwise you increment it and you redo it again. And we exactly do the same here again. Uh, initially we have, or we know the pressure, okay? And we assume the temperature. And for the assumed temperature guys, and given pressure, we find K. And of course the uh, mole fractions are given. 
okay, for the stream. And if not given, we can take a sample to the lab and using gas chromatograph, we can know exact composition of our uh, hydrocarbon gas. And then guys, uh, uh, we find K as a function of temperature and pressure. Let me jump to the next slide. So we have one example actually of uh, a K chart here for isobutane. Uh, and you see in here, it's a function of temperature and pressure. For the given pressure, let's say the pressure is 150 and the initial guess of temperature, let's say 50, we go up to 150, then we go to the left and we find the K value. After finding K value, we can calculate XI. And then guys, we can find YI divides by KI for each component. And after that, if you do it in Excel sheet, you sum all those basically uh, uh, parameters for all components. If equals to one with a range of error, okay, then you satisfy your solution. If not equal to one, you go back to step one and you change the value of temperature. You say temperature now, let's say it was 150. You make a step change of temp in temperature, let's say of five. Now you take 155. And in your computer program or Excel sheet, this can be done within uh, minutes or seconds if, if uh, you program this. And you keep actually iterating, and that's why it's called trial and error procedure. You keep iterating until the sum of this part will be equal to one, let's say, 0. 0.001, okay? If the error is, let's say, one over 1,000, it's quite small, or if you have single or double precision. So now when you uh, uh, meet the error, specified error, you stop and you know your unknown temperature. So this is the, the way uh, analytical methods work, okay? Well, uh, the third part and the last part of uh, uh, today's uh, lecture eventually is related to methods used to inhibit hydrate formation. How can we uh, prevent? Because prevention is better than treatment, guys. If you prevent it, definitely you pay uh, some money. Uh, but if you have to treat, then you have to pay much more uh, money for treatment. So we have to prevent hydrate formation. And in order to do so, we have to think of the cause of hydrate formation and to address each cause and to control each cause and to uh, uh, minimize it or remove it, okay? And you remember the causes are high pressure, low temperature, presence of water. So uh, then uh, 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 preventive measures, are nothing but to have control over temperature or pressure. And this eventually can be done. And the second one, guys, is to inject some chemicals, okay, to uh, remove the water. And the third one is to use some mechanical means or physical methods, okay, uh, uh, to uh, get rid of the water or to remove the water. So the first one eventually is the easiest to control temperature and pressure of the gas stream. While the second and the third one uh, uh, are associated with uh, some cost, okay? One is chemical and the other one is a physical process. So today we will talk about the first two while the third one will be covered in the next um, webinar next week. Well, temperature pressure control, guys, uh, uh, we said uh, it is a requirement for uh, hydrates to form high pressure. We know that, guys, when we produce initially uh, from the reservoir during, let's say, primary recovery, the pressure is quite high. And this might create problem to us in the surface. Those uh, surface engineers, uh, their job is really 
uh, as a petroleum engineer, let's say senior level or third year petroleum engineer, you always think of having very high pressure is good because we don't have to have compression station in the surface. So gas will be flown by itself. But there are some other reasons, guys, to worry about. Sometimes we have to uh, uh, minimize pressure drop intentionally. And this is one of the reasons hydrate formation is a big issue. As you've seen it in the very first slides, when we get a plug of hydrates, and by the way, these plugs are not short. It's not a one meter plug. Sometimes they actually vary from tens to hundreds of meters. So they can plug the pipeline completely. A pipeline picking, as you know, uh, sending a pick in the pipeline does not help resolving the issue. So we have to think of the main actually driving forces behind this one, and we have to handle them quite well. Well, uh, depressurization, reducing the pressure eventually is, is a good technique or get good strategy. But where can we do this? Because, you know, when you decrease the pressure, so pressure, as you know, ideal gas or real gas equation of state, you have BV is equal to NZRT. There is a direct proportionality between pressure and temperature. You decrease the pressure, you decrease the temperature, right? And this is undesired. And for hydrate, these two things work against each other. And how can we do that? Eventually, one way of controlling the temperature is by installation of a downhole regulator or a chop at the bottom hole to actually restrict the pressure. So we uh, basically prevent the formation pressure uh, from being delivered to a uh, uh, large uh, or high value on the surface. And by doing so in the production tubing, guys, the drop in temperature will not be that significant. And eventually we, we get our gas to the surface driven by nature and the drop in temperature is uh, minimum. So this is one way actually of controlling the uh, temperature. Starting, we think of this method, uh, starting from the formation, starting from the bottom hole area or the well port. The second method, which is basically related to uh, heating or heat transfer uh, by a heat exchanger, which is called indirect heaters, okay? So we don't provide heat inside the pipeline. So we provide, as you can see guys in the picture here, we provide the most important uh, parts of our surface facilities or pipelines, joints, uh, valves, etc., where we expect hydrates to get formed because of cooling or reduction in temperature we wrap them with heat jackets and we provide these parts with a, a certain amount of heat to keep their temperature as high as possible. And again, this is based on uh, some calculation. Practically guys, it was determined that temperature drop could be or could reach 80 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And uh, gas flow lines, per a distance of 5,000 feet. So each 5,000 feet, the temperature drop could be up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really significant, okay? And imagine now we have some throttling in the valve, so this will result in further cooling in the uh, pipeline. And the third method, guys, in here is to uh, use, uh, or the second method, okay? So the first method, uh, uh, the first method eventually is uh, regulator. The second method is uh, heater, indirect heating. And eventually the third method uh, is uh, chemical injections, okay? So chemical injections in here, uh, uh, they play a significant role in shifting the freezing point because we get hydrate because the water molecules get frozen. Now, if water gets frozen, let's say at, uh, uh, at zero, 
And now when it is mixed with hydrocarbons at a little bit higher temperature, we need to add some chemicals that shift the freezing point down. Uh, I believe most of you guys had taken chemistry, especially chemistry too, where you did talk about chemistry of solutions. And you had two cases. One uh, was called uh, um, freezing point depression, and the other one was called boiling point appreciation. So uh, you depress the freezing point and you appreciate or you increase the boiling point. And this is actually done a lot in the uh, industry, okay? Uh, we need here, we know that actually hydrate gets formed because of a very low temperature that we might reach in the pipeline, especially if you look at the seabed, we know that many countries use uh, gas pipelines laid out actually in the seabed where the temperature drops significantly during uh, winter time and can reach the uh, hydrate formation temperature. Uh, in the northern part of our globe, uh, in Canada, in Europe, in, um, in Siberia, in all these countries eventually where we have snow, okay, so we could face this issue. The temperature is always below zero. So we have to uh, uh, deal with this issue uh, uh, seriously. So guys, uh, uh, hydrate formation or, or chemical injections eventually is not utilized in all cases. Why? Because of the cost. The chemicals are quite expensive. And now if you talk about large amount of chemicals to be injected, then uh, this might be economically unfeasible and can be done. But there are eventually some uh, uh, hydrate inhibitors can be injected or uh, can be uh, used in some cases where uh, the hydrate formation is not for long time, okay? Let's say for a few days or for a month throughout the year, okay, during the winter uh, uh, time. Now, when the hydrate formation eventually uh, dew point is a few degrees below the uh, formation point is not that significant, maybe five to 10 degrees, okay? And of course, uh, uh, if in some uh, gas gathering system where we have a, a pressure uh, decline, so this is, again, it can be used over there. And if we have some uh, uh, local or localized spot where we get hydrate formation, like, for example, valve, the joints, elbows, whatever con different connections. So on those connections, we get actually uh, hydrates formed. We, we don't need to spend lots of chemicals uh, and, and those. So these are the minimum. So as I mentioned, guys, uh, um, chemicals work more or less similar to antifreeze, okay? Uh, you know, in the cars during the winter time, uh, Dr. Ahmed with us actually, and he said they have lots of snow in Ohio today. In order for the car to run the second day, they have to add antifreeze to uh, uh, the coolant system or radiator, okay? And what does it do, this coolant? Eventually, it depresses the freezing point. Instead, uh, when water does freeze at zero, it goes down and it freezes at the so-called delta F freezing, okay? And this is exactly what we do with respect to uh, 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 gas, uh, hydrates actually prevention. So we inject the chemicals to uh, depress or to shift this point, triple point of water to shift it down. And as a consequence of this one, the freezing actually line of uh, solid solvent will be shifted and the solvent eventually is water. The salute is whatever we add as chemical, it will be shifted by this amount. As a consequence, guys, of this shift, eventually there is another shift in the boiling point at the right-hand side for water. Well, uh, two chemicals are used for uh, this purpose, and in this lecture, I will touch base with each of them. 
So the first one, guys, is uh, methanol, methanol injection. Uh, methanol actually is widely used, but it has a problem or it has a disadvantage or it has a drawback, which is that we cannot recover it, okay? So we use it and we lose it. Why do we lose it? Because of its vapor pressure. Its vapor pressure is so high, that's why eventually methanol vaporizes into gaseous phase, okay? Nevertheless, methanol is soluble in water and soluble in hydrocarbon as well. But because of its high vapor pressure, uh, we cannot eventually uh, recover. It has some other uh, properties which are really good. Uh, methanol is an inert liquid. It's a liquid actually colorless like water. It smells like alcohol. And it is non-corrosive, which is excellent. And that's what we need in our uh, pipeline. It is inert, which means it does not react with any of the hydrocarbon or any of the gases, does not contribute to any reaction, which is again, uh, excellent. And uh, eventually is cheap, is not expensive, okay? And this could be uh, looked at as an advantage of methanol utilizations, okay? Uh, uh, as I said, it is soluble actually in hydrocarbons and its solubility in hydrocarbons could go, go to 0.5% by weight. You know, guys, along with gas, we always produce gas condensate, which is liquid. And to us, if methanol is soluble in gas condensate, then it might be significantly attracted, okay, at the cost of being soluble in water, because this solubility is much larger than its solubility in water. And uh, uh, this might result in having large amount of the injected methanol uh, uh, to be actually soluble in uh, um, condensate. And this makes the process unattractive at all. So this could be a, a, a drawback. And the other one, I said, it's vaporizations because of its high pressure. Now, to assure that methanol works very well, it's good to inject it away ahead or upstream of the treatment point or of the treatment joint. Okay, so in case if it will be vaporized, so it will reach that point and it can eventually mix up and uh, heal the process in the uh, treatment zone. The other chemical that can be used, which is the glycol, guys. A glycol is similar to uh, uh, methanol in terms of uh, functionality, okay? But the good thing about the glycol, it has lower vapor pressure. And you know this from uh, thermodynamics, vapor, high vapor pressure eventually results in having, uh, uh, having the uh, gas or having the uh, liquid to vaporize. And maybe you remember from surface facilities when you do oil stabilization, okay? Oil stabilization is to remove the light hydrocarbon from oil because of their low, because of their high, actually, vapor pressure, okay? Exactly the same thing applies here. So, uh, but with respect to glycol, it has lower vapor pressure compared to uh, methanol. And the other advantage of using glycol, we can recover it, which means uh, this will result in reducing the cost of uh, glycol while injected into uh, gaseous stream. There are three types of uh, glycol used. Uh, the first one actually is ethylene glycol. The second one is diethylene and the third one is triethylene glycol. So these are the more, most widely used uh, uh, types. And the first one uh, is used for uh, uh, high hydrate depression. If we need to depress the hydrate further, or the depression temperature to be large, 
we use eventually the ethylene glycol, but if the losses are large, if because of its high vapor pressure, eventually uh, we move to the second diethylene glycol and triethylene glycol. Well, uh, actually, uh, glycols are expensive as well, okay? And uh, to minimize the amount of glycol and uh, methanol uh, uh, injected into the gas stream, we can actually follow a better way is to get rid of the large amount of water produced along with the gas. And how can we do this? Okay, we can do this eventually by having a separator or a free water knockout. When the pressure is low, we use the free water knockout and we get rid of uh, most of the water. We minimize the amount of water because eventually we have to have uh, 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 ratios between injected chemicals and the amount of water in the gaseous stream, okay? And uh, this uh, eventually can be uh, done uh, quite easy and to uh, basically get rid of water uh, right when we produce the gaseous stream. So how do we design uh, a glycol injections or how much a glycol or methanol is needed to be injected, okay, to, uh, uh, to treat our uh, gas and to prevent hydrate from being born? Uh, this can be done, guys, based on the so-called Hammer-Schmidt, actually, equation. And Hammer-Schmidt equation is designed to find the temperature depression, okay, uh, of hydrate formation, which is delta T equals KW divided by M multiplied by 100 minus W, where M is the molecular weight actually of chemicals to be injected. K is a constant related to chemicals to be injected, with, whether it is methanol or a glycol. And W eventually is the weight percent of chemical uh, injected for the sake of water treatment. All what we need guys to get from uh, this equation is percentage. How much chemical has to be injected with the known flow rate of gas. And along with gas, we said we know the flow rate of water and sometimes we have condensate. So from this equation, we calculate the percentage and then we utilize the calculated percentage to find the amount or how many pounds or how many tons of methanol or glycol can be used. Well, from this table, guys, you grab uh, both M and K, okay? And uh, uh, to understand it better, let's look at this example and we will wrap it up for today, okay? Uh, by this example, what does it state? Actually, a gas well produces 10 million standard cubic feet per day, along with 2,000 pounds of water. So we have production of gas. 10 million standard cubic feet per day. And we have a production of water, which is 2,000 pounds of water per day, and 700 barrels per day of condensate. We get large amount of condensate as well. That has a density of 300 pounds per barrel. So we have uh, three phases, okay? almost, it's two phases actually, liquid and uh, gas, but we have condensate and we have water. So this is troublesome to us guys, and this is the most complicated uh, eventually case to deal with when it comes to hydrate. So the hydrate formation temperature at the flowing pressure is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is good. Uh, if the average flow line temperature is 65 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have a depression by 10. 
So this makes sure that hydrates is formed. There is no way, okay? Now you are asked to determine the amount of methanol needed. You could do it for methanol, for glycol, okay, of any type. Uh, to inhibit hydrate formation in the flow line, given that the methanol solubility in condensate is 0.5% by weight, and this is a fact, known fact, and that the ratio of the bounds methanol in vapor phase of gas to the weight percent of methanol in water is 0.95. So this is another fact to know how much we can have methanol in vapor to liquid, okay? Well, let's see how can we solve this one. Uh, uh, we know that the temperature goes down eventually to 65. Then we need to calculate the uh, change in temperature from 75 to uh, uh, 65, which is 10 degrees Fahrenheit. We use uh, uh, the so said equation, uh, Schmidt equation, Hammer-Smith, uh, which is delta T KWM 100 minus W. We plug actually K and M from the table previously shown for methanol. And we have one equation, one unknown. You solve it directly and what you get, you get the uh, weight percent of uh, uh, methanol inhibitor for water treatment is 12.07. So 12.07% has to be methanol. But now we have to go back to uh, our problem statements. We have three different streams. We have gas. We have water, and the third one we have is condensate. Now we need to look at each component and see how much eventually methanol is needed to uh, treat each of these three phases, although there are two phases, okay, liquid and gas, but because of uh, uh, different nature of the liquid phase. Now, uh, required methanol, guys, in water, is equal to the percentage multiplied by 2,000 pounds of water, and we get 241.4 pounds of methanol per day are required to treat water. Now, uh, how much is required to treat gas? Okay, so eventually 0.95%, uh, which 0.95, which is the ratio of methanol in gas to liquid, this is given multiplied by 12.07%, which is W, we get 11.47 pounds per million standard cubic feet. Now, how much gas does it flow? We have 10 million. We multiply this one by 10 million, and what we get, guys, we get the amount of methanol needed to treat the gas is 114.7 pounds per day. And the last one, how much methanol is needed to treat the condensate? We know that the solubility is 0.5%, uh, which is 0 0.005. We multiply it by the density of condensate, 300, and we multiply it by the flow rate of condensate, which is 700. And we obtain that uh, the amount of methanol needed to treat the condensate is 1050 pounds per day, which is very large. So the total amount required, guys, is eventually uh, 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 1,406 pounds per day. If you look at these three uh, amounts required for treatments, eventually the largest one is required to treat the condensate, okay? While the condensate is not an issue at all, the condensate does not form hydrate. The one that forms hydrate is what? Is eventually water. And if you look how much amount or how much methanol is required to treat water is 241.4. So basically about 75% of the requested methanol goes to treat condensate which we have no problem with, okay? And this uh, eventually uh, uh, 
it drives the cost up. And what does it tell us? This uh, it tells us that uh, the process is uh, completely unfeasible and uneconomical. And the best way to do, guys, is to get rid of condensate ahead of treatment. So, and how could we know this? The only way to know this is by calculation. You make your calculations and you look how much methanol or glycol is required for each phase. And then you make your reasoning and you make your analysis and you decide whether to go for uh, X solution or Y solution. So the calculation dictated us uh, a fact that Condensate has to be eventually separated ahead of treatment. And what you can see, guys, in this slide, the references I refer to in different figures and table. By doing so, I uh, uh, stop here and wrap up uh, today's lecture eventually without a conclusion, but we covered three main topics and we got to know what hydrate is what are the conditions eventually uh, that have to exist or coexist for hydrate formation? And how can we prevent hydrate formation uh, by three different methods? So thank you so much for being so patient. We took one hour, which is good enough for this late time, especially in the Middle East. But for those who are attending from the western part of our globe, it's a daytime. Anyway, one, one hour is good enough to start up with. Thank you so well, much. Thank you, doctor, for this informative session. You're welcome. Uh, we will try to, to answer the most frequently asked questions. Okay. Question number one. Uh, could you please explain viewpoint with regard to the phase diagram? Well, uh, actually, uh, do point, guys, if, um, if you remember uh, the temperature at which uh, water starts to condensate, okay? So uh, water uh, eventually in the vapor phase, if we, if we think about it, let's say in atmosphere. So uh, water is available in atmosphere and measured in terms of humidity. Now, uh, when we get water out of humid air, sometimes uh, you walk in a humid air, but you don't feel the water. When the temperature drops down, okay, when the temperature goes down to the dew point, you start seeing droplets of water. And this is basically the dew point. Uh, can you see it in, uh, for example, uh, in, in the daytime or in the afternoon? Uh, you can see this mostly in the morning when the temperature is quite low. Sometimes uh, when the humidity is high, uh, you come, for example, to your car and you see droplets of oil, uh, droplets of water actually in the windshield or in the front glass, back glass, uh, or oil glasses. And this is basically uh, uh, the dew point effect, okay? It exactly happens the same in, um, uh, in oil and gas, okay? So uh, in oil and gas, we have tricondentherm. If, uh, if you look at the phase diagram of multi-component system, you have pressure versus uh, temperature down in the reservoir, and you have uh, eventually the envelope, and it is in the right-hand side when uh, gas it gets into the liquid phase from uh, dry to wet and to liquid phase. Uh, okay. okay, second question. Uh, how can we make sure that heating the gas flow stream in order to dehydrate will not evaporate components of the gas? Well, uh, Actually, the process or the treatment is not uh, open to the atmosphere, okay? So the process is done in the pipeline or the treatment itself or dehydration process is not done at atmospheric pressure. And I mentioned this at the very beginning. So the gas is treated as a rear gas because we talk about high pressure, right? Okay, high pressure and low temperature. And when we depressurize 
We don't go to atmospheric pressure, guys. We always operate at higher pressure because we still in need for a, a pressure drive or a pressure drop to drive our fluid. And this definitely results in lots of saving when it comes to compression station. Guys, pressure value actually, which is uh, required for vaporization or for a uh, driving effect, okay, is so difficult to judge when we have uh, uh, gas flow rate compared to uh, oil flow rate. So in here, we have to be careful. And this is the reason uh, gas hydrates is a big issue or is a troublesome issue. Okay, that is linked directly with the pressure. But again, we do not uh, deep pressurize to atmospheric pressure. We don't lose gases, okay? The gas is still there. The gas does not get, uh, uh, does not participate to uh, eventually uh, hydrate formation, okay? And it is still there, it is in the system. Dehydration is related directly to water to getting rid of water, whether it comes from the reservoir, whether it comes or associated with the oil, okay, and we separate it, and then uh, a mist, actually, a mist of this water is carried away by, uh, by gas through the mist extra extractor, and in here, we don't talk about small amounts. We talk about large amounts sometimes carried out along with gas. Okay, next. Uh, okay. What is, uh, okay, this one. So can we remove the water vapor in the reservoir? Uh, guys, we don't talk about the reservoir because uh, we cannot go down to the reservoir and uh, remove I think they the... are mixing up between the... Yes, let me, let, let, yes. let me make it very clear, guys. Yeah, so uh, uh, dehydration or gas dehydration is carried out in the surface. It's basically a treatment process related to surface facilities, related to transportation, gas transportation, related to uh, whatever done to the gas or happens with the gas while it is carried in the surface. Uh, uh, I know why they mix. They mix because we say in, uh, uh, the requirement for uh, uh, gas hydration is high pressure. And they link this one with the reservoir when we have initial production, when the reservoir is not depleted yet, the pressure is so high. But the temperature is very high as well. Guys, if you, uh, uh, if you go to the phase diagram, okay, uh, eventually, uh, to the right of the envelope, the temperature for gas formation is quite large, okay? So reservoir temperature is large, reservoir pressure is large. So we don't worry about uh, hydrate formation in the reservoir. We worry about hydrate formation in the shallow reservoir or very close, about let's say 600 feet uh, uh, below the wellhead and in the surface facilities as well, okay? Okay, Luma. Okay, that's pretty much it for the question. Okay. Uh, thank you again, doctor, for your valuable yeah. time. You are welcome. Thank I would you like so to much. remind, thank you, thank you so much. I would like to remind you that this session is being recorded and will be posted on PyPetro YouTube channel. Stay tuned for the other upcoming webinars by following Arab Oil and Gas Academy Facebook page. We wish you all the best of luck and a fruitful day. Till next time. Thank you.